Welcome to part two of electric fields and motion of charged particles. In this lesson, we're going to look at the magnitude of electric field um, between two parallel plates. If they're separated at a certain distance, we're going to solve problems using the electric field strength formula. We're going to talk about the force on a charged particle. We're going to derive a formula for the acceleration of a particle. So that's a derivation. That's very important. You know that. Then we're going to solve some problems with it. We we'll describe the motion in parallel and anti-parallel situations. So parallel plates, that's our first aspect here. The parallel plate we've touched on before in the electric field concept of its two charged plates parallel to each other. We can think of them as infinite plates or real world plates where they do have an end. To set this up, all we do is we create a potential difference between two opposite conducting plates. So hook it up to a battery source or the power or something like that generates a difference one of them becomes charged the other one is negative or not charged you've got a potential difference therefore you're going to have an electric field there the electric field between these plates when you're not on the edge is uniform so we've talked about that previously anywhere in that field it's uniform the lines are equally spaced they're parallel to each other so the strength does not change and the field is uniform in its direction a positive charge will experience the same force in this field no matter where it's placed. That's an important concept. So if I put it here, it's going to whiz towards the negative plate at exactly the same speed and force as if I put it here, here, or here. It does not matter. Now if we consider a small positive test charge that's moved from the lower plate to the upper plate as we're shown below. So it's moved towards the positive plate, which it doesn't want to do. We need to work, do work on it then. If it's moving against the field, it's doing what it doesn't want to do, then we have to apply work to it. And we've said previously that the work to done on this thing is Q delta V, or from previous um, formulas and simple year 11 physics, we talked about it as the force times the distance. If the electric field strength is the force divided by Q, and we also know that work is Q delta V or force times distance, we can just replace this force with the electric field force. So F over Q is delta V over D, rearranging this thing. Therefore, if we just rearrange all of that using this formula, we get that the electric field strength is the force uh, delta V over the distance. So the electric field strength is the change in potential divided by the distance. So it's an important definition to know. The electric field between two oppositely charged parallel conducting plates separated by distance d is given by E equals delta V over D. So the potential difference between the plates divided by the distance between them gives you the electric field strength. The units here are volts per meter because I've got delta V which is a volt and the distance is meters. It's going to be volts per meter. And lastly, the direction of the field is from the positive plate to the negative plate. So in all of these parallel situations, the field always goes from positive to negative. Don't forget that the electric field is a vector. So E is a vector here. So if we give a strength or they ask, what is the electric field? What is E? You have to give the direction as well. So you need to say it's from the positive to the negative plate. Or if it's in something really extravagant later on, give the actual direction of it. But it's important to remember it is a vector. Here we've got an example. So if we create an electric field between two parallel plates by putting a potential of two kilovolts, I put the plates two centimeters apart. Tell me what is the magnitude and the direction of the electric field between these plates? So hopefully you've had a go at this, but we use the formula that we've used in the previous slide. So the electric field strength is the change of potential divided by the distance between the plates. I plug those things in, my two kilovolts, which is killer, 10 to the three, divided by the distance, make sure you use meters, because it has to be SI units. And I get 1.00 times 10 to the five volts per meter towards the lower plate, because you need the direction. So this you may not be familiar with, but this notation here is your power supply. This is how we symbolize it. So the positive terminal is the bigger line. So in case you're not sure about what the direction was, this fat line here is your positive terminal, which means this is your positive plate. 
This is your negative plate, which is why it moves downwards towards the lower plate. Now, if we consider two charges, we've got our parallel plate again, and I've got a positive and a negative charge. The positive charge is going to experience the downward force because its electric field is pushing it away from that plate, and it's going to move with the field. Its motion is parallel to the electric field. So we would say it's moving in the direction, it's parallel. The negative charge experiences an upward force due to the electric field, and it's going to accelerate towards the positive plate. So it's actually moving against the electric field because it's an attractive force. So we would say that this is moving anti-parallel. So moving parallel to the field tells you that you're moving in the direction of the field lines. Moving anti-parallel means you're moving 180 degrees against the field lines. So positives move parallel, negatives move anti-parallel. That's an important concept as well. If we've got a uniform electric field, the force experienced by the charge is given by E times Q. So the electric field strength times by the charge of the object gives us the force that's exerted on that object. And as it says in red, both force and electric field are vectors. So we should have a vector force because we're using a vector to calculate it. So this tells us that if the charge is positive, the direction of the force is the same as the field. If the charge is negative, the direction is opposite the direction of the field. So that's our parallel anti-parallel concepts again. If the field is constant, then so is the force. So if we take our parallel situation, if we're within this section, it's a uniform field, so it doesn't matter where we are, the force is exactly the same. If we use Newton's second law, a charge placed in a uniform field will experience an acceleration. It's got a force on it and it has a mass, so it has to accelerate. We can use then the force equals EQ formula and substitute the F equals MA into it. We get that F equals EQ, but F is also equal to MA, so we put it on either side, MA equals EQ. We rearrange and we get that acceleration is EQ over M. So this is the derivation that you're expected to know, how to derive the acceleration of a particle in an electric field. So it's quite simple, it's just this formula and Newton's second law, and you rearrange for acceleration and you've got it. So this case, it tells us that the acceleration of a particle in a uniform field is directly proportional to the product of the electric field strength and the charge, and it's inversely proportional to the mass of the object. E is constant, therefore A is constant in this case, with a parallel situation. Charge of electric field, or the electric field strength in a parallel situation, it's always constant, so the acceleration is constant. So it doesn't matter where my object is in this field, it's going to accelerate at the same rate. Okay, so have a go at this question. I'll give you a minute. If you need more time, you can pause it, but have a go at this. Okay, so time is up. Um, I'm going to reveal the answers to this. So the electron accelerates at a constant rate anti-parallel to the field because it's going to move in the opposite direction to the field lines. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. I use my QE over M formula from before and I get that it's 4.2 times 10 to the 15 meters per second. So previously we've analyzed the motion of objects in gravitational fields. So in all of our projectile motion, we talked about things like what happens if you drop a ball? What happens if you throw a ball upwards? What happens if you project it horizontally in a field? So we've done all these things and we've calculated the motion in a gravitational field. But now we've said that the electric field kind of acts very, very similar. So we might expect the electric field to create the same sort of results 
using a charged object rather than an object with a mass. The question that I ponder for you, and this is very similar to the relativity concept of knowing which frame of reference you're in, is how would you tell if a ball was in a gravitational field or it was a charged ball in an electric field? Would you be able to distinguish between the two things? And that's an interesting problem. The answer is actually no. The calculations and the values may be slightly different, but if I showed you a video of an object on a table and it was moving, you wouldn't be able to tell if I had the table vertically and the ball was sliding down it, or if it was a horizontal table with an electric field in it that was pushing the object across. The motion would be exactly the same. And if I threw the object, it would curve and it would travel in exactly the same sort of path as it would in a gravitational field. So once we know the acceleration of this particle that we've talked about so far, we can then use this information to calculate other things. We can look at how long it takes the object to travel a certain distance. We can figure out its final velocity. We could work backwards and calculate its initial velocity. And we can do things like how long has it traveled in a certain amount of time. The acceleration due to an electric field is exactly the same as the acceleration due to gravity in the calculations, not in the actual value. So because of this, we can just use the equations of motion to calculate other factors of an object. So jogging your memory, we've got our V equals V naught plus AT. So we can find the final velocity or the acceleration, the time or the initial velocity. I've got my S equals V naught T plus half AT squared. The V squared minus V naught squared equals 2AS. Sometimes this is written differently as V squared equals V naught squared plus 2AS. Exactly the same thing. So I can use these now that I know the accelerations in these case to find other pieces of information. So a good example of that is the worked questions here. So have a go at these questions um, using this concept. So if we know the acceleration, first find the magnitude and direction, then find the acceleration, then use this acceleration to calculate other factors. Okay, so if you need more time, just pause the video and keep going. Otherwise, I'm going to give you the answers now. So the magnitude, we're using the delta V over D for the electric field strength. And remember, it needs a direction. So it's towards the lower plate in this case. Now I'm finding the acceleration. So that's my QE over M formula. And I get 5.46 times 10 to the 11 meters per second squared. So that's quite a fast acceleration. Calculate the force acting on the proton in this electric field at A, B, and C. So given that it's uniform, it doesn't really care where it is. The force is exactly the same. I use my Newton's law if I want to do it this way, and I get 9.13 times 10 to the minus 16. I could also use the F equals QE formula, and that would give me virtually exactly the same answer. So I've got a 0 0.01 difference, but that's okay. Time taken for a proton released. So that's my motion formula. S equals V naught T plus half AT squared. The work done is Q delta V, so I get my joules. The gain in speed is the work is equal to the half mv squared, the kinetic energy. Plug everything in, I get the velocity. So as a side note, there are usually two types of problems when we discuss the motion in an electric field. You can have a kinematic style question, which uses our equations of motion. So it's exactly like we saw back here, where we used half mv squared. That's a kinematic style. We could also have an energetic style, which is using the concept of energy changes. So in most of the cases, you can find the information using either method, but sometimes one method is just going to be simpler than the other. So an example of that would be this here. 
So here they've said, calculate the force, acceleration, time, final velocity, final kinetic energy. So question four and five, you can see they've used the equations of motion here, and in five they've used kinetic energy. But we could just as well use the energetic method, which is shown here. So I could have done exactly the same thing as question four and five by using the change of kinetic energy for five rather than the equation of motion. And same thing for question four. If I knew the kinetic energy, I can use that to work backwards and find the velocity. So rather than using the equations of motion in question four, I've used the kinetic energy value to plug back in and I've done it as an energetic style question. So while this is good to know, and sometimes it may help you solve a certain problem, hopefully you can see in this case that this is significantly more work if you only needed to find one thing. So if you didn't need to know the change in kinetic energy and they just wanted the velocity, it's a lot easier to use the equation of motion. If you did it this way, you then had to find what is the kinetic energy, then substitute that to find the velocity. In the other case, you could just use the energetic formula to find it in a much quicker method. So just like in physics, there's often a lot of ways to do things. Here, they'll both give you the same answer, but one is going to take you a lot more time. So feel free to have a look at that and sort of distinguish between the two. Another similar example is in the previous examples that we went through. So here, you can see that they've used F equals QE. So that's your energetic style, but they've also used Newton's second law to calculate the same thing. So this would be like a kinematic style solution to it. Okay, so for this section, there's quite a few questions here. Question four to nine on page 153. Four gives you questions about drawing, calculating the electric field strength and acceleration in parallel plates. Question five has a uniform field with a proton and the equations of motion. So very similar, but you've got the opposite charge and you need the equations of motion. Question six gives you an energetic approach style question. So what we just talked about using the energetic rather than the kinematic. Question seven is protons in a parallel plates. Question eight is an ion thruster question. So we talked about the ion thruster back in conservation of momentum in terms of how it uses its propulsion system. Now we can talk about the actual electric field side of things for an ion thruster. And question nine is a suspended object question. So if I had two charges,